and um, I'll, I'll uh, introduce you to Sam very shortly. He's going to give us a talk on um, improving uh, on train air quality, uh, specifically on the uh, Attache class 800s. Um, so um, before we before we make a start, um, if I could just um, let you advise you on the two future and, and, um, Northeast Central events. Um, uh, next month we have Derek, Derek Rayner, a long-standing member, who's, um, who's going to talk to us about industrial railways um, around York, which I'm, I'm really looking forward to. If, if this replaces our traditional film evening, but um, I think Derek's going to look after us very amicably uh, in, in a month's time. Um, and then in January, we return to an in-person event, a joint event with the PWI. Um, and Adrian Marston is a, is a colleague, uh, is a, a client of mine, uh, and I've worked with him introducing this new spray train. He's, he's going to tell us how the first year of operations has gone. And then the PWI um, uh, colleagues in York, um, uh, Present, uh, presenting with Richard Cunningham, who's going to give us a complimentary talk um, to the to the weed spraying. Um, so I don't quite know Richard's content, but I'll, uh, that'll come out and become more clear near the time. So, um, finally, um, contact information, um, should you want to find us, um, again, the key events page, a little bit difficult, but many people know to now you search for railways and then select free events and, and you get all the various um, divisions. Um, uh, railway, uh, railway, railway division webpage, that's a direct link. Um, the old fashioned way, the near you website. Um, and then we have our own LinkedIn page there. Um, and if you drop me an email on this address, um, we can add you to our distribution list as well. So, um, I will uh, hand over to Sam um, and um, um, let's um, um, have a, you know, a very revealing paper on, uh, on train air quality. So, um, Sam, over to you. Um, uh, uh, so thanks. You have to stop sharing. I'll stop sharing, so hopefully we can now. Um, right here, that's, we've got the, uh, the, the yeah, uh, classic sample. Is it? Yeah, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, so this is a talk about improving air quality on, on the Class 800 fleet. Um, so I'll, I'll go into an introduction about um, how we, we came to, to take on this research, um, background about the, the problem and how it was identified. Uh, and then I'll talk about a, a, a compliant train, but how it can still have a problem. And then uh, talk about what nitrogen dioxide is, because that was the problem that was found, our research and approach to it, and then the, the testing that we carried out, some proof of concept testing that we needed to do, uh, which we'll, we'll come out with when I talk about the research. Um, some CFD modeling, which was very interesting when, when we were looking into this. And then some of the in-service testing that we're currently undertaking and um, conclusions to, to where we are at the moment. So um, the RSSB carried out an investigation on air quality and it was a, a, a very general uh, air pro program about air quality within the railway. So not only on trains, but uh, stations and depots and, and around there as well. But part of it was um, carrying out air quality on board trains. Um, there was a series of trains looked at. One of them was a class 800 on the Great Western, and the results came back of having high uh, nitrogen dioxide levels. Now, the report really, I don't think anyone expected to see those results. So, the cause of the NO2 really wasn't fully understood because it was just purely looking at, um, at air quality on the vehicle and, and not connecting it to anything else. So that's where Atachi and, and uh, I was um, put in the lead to establish what the root cause was, establish what bad and good levels of NO2 are, um, 
develop a strategy to reduce those NO2 levels because we accepted that the, the peak shouldn't be there. Um, but then it was out and testing and test and test again to understand exactly why these NO2 levels were occurring and then develop and introduce a solution to reduce NO2 levels to uh, an acceptable level on board the train. So the background is, this is the, the um, RSSB study, uh, T1188. And I've just taken the section that was looking at the 800s that was conducted in 2020. So the, the graph at the top, it shows all the different um, uh, areas they're looking at. So it's nitrogen dioxide, particulates, both of these PM10 and PM2.5. And um, I think it's uh, uh, black carbon as well was the other one, but it was the, the NO2 that was of interest. And the outcome, and I've just put it in, in here at the bottom, was that there was high levels of concentration uh, found on the, the London to Bristol route on the class 800. Uh, concentrations of a mean of 208, uh, 208 micrograms per cubic meter with peach rise, it rising up to 840 micrograms per cubic meter. Now this was compared to a roadside mean and that was very low. So it was only 27 uh, grams per cubic, micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, and then compares it to, to some roadside means, a 15 minute mean of eight to 314 micrograms per cubic meter. Now there were some things with this because it wasn't quite like for like. So we're looking at averages of a minute and then peaks of, of, of around 15. And it didn't really say why they were occurring. We could see these peaks, but why that was occurring wasn't, completely identified. We, we could come up with ideas, but again, we didn't have um, the information. So Atachi went out and, and uh, my team went out and we started to gather data. Now, we had our own equipment that could monitor NO2. And we decided that we should repeat that experiment like for like as close as possible and to, to understand if we could repeat it for one, and then when it was tied into train data as well, if we could see anything from the train data. Now, in addition, just to, to taking the TMS data, um, we also took observational data as well. So we wanted to make sure that it wasn't a passing freight train or a building site. We wanted to make sure 100% what was occurring. Um, and the results were quite interesting. So this graph here, and I appreciate it's small, and I apologize for that, but um, I'll just take you through it. So the NO2 levels were this light blue line, just bumbling around the bottom here, and then it does peak, these three peaks here. We've got speed, the orange line, which is uh, showing our, our, our speed in kilometers. The gray line is the combined power brake controller. So 100 is full power, zero is emergency brake, and idle is 50%. So that's how this works, it's how it's displayed. We've also got the power state. So we've got uh, when it's an electric, it's zero, and when it goes to, to diesel or, or self-powered mode, to one, so you can see where it switches over in this area around here. And we've also got the fresh air dampers as well. So it's, again, it's a very binary one on or off. And the reason for these is um, just to, to understand about fresh air intake, they're there to, for passenger comforts. They close in tunnels when the train's over 100 miles an hour, and that's to stop the pressure pulse and that uncomfortable feeling with um, your ears popping. And that's the reason for they're there, but we were monitoring that just in case. Now, the information that we got was very clear. So what we did was uh, we did four runs. We started off at, at uh, the London end of the train. So we were trailing, and then we were leading on the way back. And then we changed ends as well, just in case there was something there. So we did, we did four runs there and back and either end of the train, just to, to get that comparison. And when we combined the information, it was pretty clear. When the train was trailing in diesel, as you can see, this box diagram here is very similar to the way RSSB did it. And then we wanted to, to replicate the way they did it to the comparable results. It shows NO2 was quite high. Now, what was also interesting was our thoughts were, were, were where we think, well, it's, it's lots of power from the engine and that's what's causing it. Well, actually, when we looked at the data, it's, very, it's not very easy to see on this graph, but where you see these peaks, the power brake controller goes to 
50%, and very soon after, NO2 rises, and it's repeatable. These three peaks follow that same pattern. Power brake controller, so the engine to idle, NO2 rises. Not what we expected to see, but it was very interesting to see that that's the results we got. So it was pretty clear to say there was a relationship between the engine, the HVAC, and NO2 levels. Now we also checked the engine was, was Euro 3B compliant, met all the standards, was, was fine, and the HVAC compliant to TSI lock and pass. Again, compliant, however, lock and pass only really deals with CO2, it doesn't really deal with, with NO2. And there was not really anything in the rail industry that was NO2. So next is to understand what NO2 was, is um, to understand part of our research. So this is from the, the government website. So NO2 um, actually is, is harmful uh, to human health in large quantities. We're not dealing with the very large quantities at all. These are very small quantities, but still it can have an impact on, um, on health. Um, in, you know, with uh, lungs and breathing and uh, gen generally not, not for the, the healthy in small quantities, but certainly the, the frail and ill, it can have an impact. Now, standards and uh, guidance. Now, there are no real standards for NO2 levels. So there was nothing really that we could benchmark ourselves what was good, what was bad for a rail vehicle. There was no, nothing for us to do. So started to look outside the rail industry. So we've got the health and safety executives workplace exposure limits, which is a, a 15 minute mean of a uh, thousand parts per billion. Uh, and there's also the World Health Organization which is a far lower um, in its guidance, but they give a, a limit of 200 uh, micrograms per cubic meter. Um, roughly translated is 1.88 micrograms, which is equivalent to one part per billion. So as you can see, that is a significantly lower level than the work at health uh, uh, limits. The reason for that is workplace considers the workers. So generally everyone's in a, in a healthy uh, condition at, uh, in the working age. So not the very young, not the very old, and not the very ill, but the World Health Organization looks at everyone. So it's a much broader area that it's looking at. So that's why there's a disparity in the two results. So with no uh, guidance uh, or, or for standards uh, on NO2 levels, I started to, to expand this uh, to understand how does the industry uh, deal with NO2 uh, and what can we learn from it? Now, RSSB were, were continuing their research and um, in their paper T1234, they actually look at this relationship between exhaust and HVAC. And they too found limited information on um, exhaust and uh, train air condition, uh, train air quality. But what did come from it was they uh, there was the um, uh, some multiple units in, in Greece that had problems with exhausts entering the saloon, and in Israel as well there was um, a study about double decker trains and single decker trains. Now both of these really focused uh, focused on um, particulates or exhaust just exhaust fumes in general, not really NO2, and it was really focusing on where the intake. Is, and most of these are actually on the side of the vehicles where actually an 800 is on the, on the roof. So that's, that's really what they looked at. So I looked a bit further afield um, and it's more anecdotal, um, but from uh, speaking to um, colleagues over on, on uh, the West Coast Main Line, they had a similar problem when they started using their Class 57s to haul their EMUs, their, their Pendolinos, on the North uh, Yorkshire coast. their exhaust to, to throw the exhaust further out. But there wasn't really anything written down about it. It was more anecdotal, but at least I had that. And the other um, one was from the HSTs. So early on, they had an exhaust deflector fitted, and that was because of soot coming over the uh, windscreen. So an, an exhaust deflector just gave that little bit of uh, cushion of air that just kept the exhaust away from um, the windscreen. Again, not really NO2, but these were exhaust uh, and 
and uh, trying to look for, for how people have managed the problem in the past. But because information was limited, I looked further afield, so that was tunneling uh, and mining, and really, as you can see on the top paper uh, picture, um, large ex uh, extraction, good filtration, but not very easy to replicate on the train. You're limited on power, you're limited on space. But that was interesting to find out. And the other one was, was caving. Obviously there are some caves that, that um, have um, hazardous uh, air quality for, for humans and uh, what they do is, is they use um, uh, face masks and breathing equipment. Again, not really practical for a train, but it was interesting to see how in certain environments. And the reason I looked at those was because uh, I had to explain, expand my search and I was thinking, well, I have a tube that has exhaust gases. What's similar to that? And the best thing I could find was tunnels, caves and uh, mine shafts. And that's why I started looking that way. And the other thing that came up was, was filtration. But the filtration is large uh, and we're limited on space and, and it requires power. But one thing that they do use is activated carbon as well. So it's very good for filtering of water. And, and, and gases. So that was another thing that I took from that. So we went out and did more testing um, because when we, we looked at our results, we were in the driving cars, so not powered. And again, it was very clear it was exhaust. So when you're leading, you're not near an exhaust, so you're not getting information. And the other thing that we wanted to understand a bit more was, do tunnels have an impact on it? Do gradients, stations, there, is there anything that we're missing that we need to understand if we're going to come up with a solution? So when we started to try and work out, well, where can we test all of this? Um, I think by that time, I think Great Western had even their electrification um, extended as well. So our range on Great Western was, was limited. Um, for uh, the East Coast Main Line, it's mainly you know, north of Edinburgh. So that, that makes it very difficult. Um, but what was closer on our doorstep was actually the Trans Pennine. So not exactly an IP train, but same, very similar train, very similar design. And it gave us fantastic gradients. It gave us long tunnels. It gave us enclosed stations and all in self-powered mode. So for, for carrying out these experiments, it's, it seemed ideal. So that's why we, we went onto the trans uh, TPE network and we went from Leeds to Liverpool and back again to collect this data. So it was ideal. So we, we worked out where the gradients were, we understood where the tunnels were, um, and we also had large stations at, at Leeds and Manchester with the key Victoria, Manchester Victoria were the key stations that we knew were enclosed. So we could get some, some res results from that. So in tunnels, um, now if the train doesn't change state, so if it's constantly powering or if it's constantly uh, or, or braking or coasting through and doesn't change states in a tunnel, there's no change. If anything, actually, we saw the NO2 start to drop as, as the uh, HVAC starts to extract the air. So um, that was one thing, but if the train changed state in a tunnel, so if it goes from power to coast, it made things worse because obviously we're in a tunnel, it's, it's confined, and we did certainly see an, a, a, a dramatic increase in levels if we were in a tunnel. Um, gradients, um, it was more of a making sure that we understood the situation, no impact at all. So the train works harder, doesn't make a difference. It's really when the, the engine goes to coast. And in main big stations, yes, we did see a slight increase. Doors open, lots of other self-powered trains, so lots of diesels running. We did see a small increase if we were in a station. But we did even more testing. So we needed to understand our eight hour mean. We could extrapolate it from the data we had, but it wasn't a true eight hour mean. So that's why we decided to go from Doncaster or, or start the journey from Leeds and all the way up to Aberdeen. Um, now, the interesting thing from this was, and there's a box diagram to show it, what we got from this was the direction of the train impact on the levels. So on the way out to Aberdeen, the exhaust was behind us. You can see this in the top picture here where, where our test position was. And that's um, this train here on Whiskey 02. Our levels are fairly low on this box diagram. But when the exhaust was in front of us in the same car, there was a dramatic increase in O2. So we knew that it was a very local effect. So the whole train does have an impact on NO2 levels, but actually the exhaust closest to the HVAC, so it's actually the number one HVAC, is drawing in 
um, the larger quantity units in that in that, that direction. So it was interesting to get that as well as our eight hour minimum. So the summary of our testing. Um, so we know that there's high NO2 levels. So the engine only produces too much such a short time, but the HVAC system draws it. Have, and, and power demand have no impact on NO2 levels. In closed stations, NO2 does rise slightly, and you can see in the picture that's actually a set of leads. And we're looking at air quality actually in the station as well. Um, direction of travel has an impact on NO2 levels as well. And we, knew, we found that it was very clear that we had a system interface between the engine and the HVAC system. Now, this is something in standards that aren't joined together. So it was never looked at in testing, it's never looked at in standards. But when we put it into the real world, and we're looking at how different systems interface with each other, we found we've got this, this issue. So the, the next stage is to understand and find a way to reduce NO2 levels, ideally overall, but the main focus was certainly in the saloon, because in only a short period of time it's generated outside, it's in the saloon, it takes 20 minutes to dissipate. So I used uh, a methodology of hierarchy of control. And that was to, to work through the different solutions. Now, and, and as I'll go through them, some of them you can see would be dismissed straight away, but that was the approach I took. So if I start, um, I was start actually at the bottom with, with um, PPE. Now at the time I was coming up to this, asking passengers to wear face masks seemed to be um, an outrageous thing to do. And that was before, this was during COVID, we, we had all of this. Um, but again, it was before the face masks were mandatory. But anyway, for NO2, it's certainly not acceptable. It wouldn't work. And it's certainly something that you couldn't ask long term. So it's instantly ruled out. Uh, administrative controls. Again, you, having pr pro processes and procedures, it, dis um, it disadvantages uh, some passengers from traveling. It's certainly un unacceptable. So that was completely ruled out. Um, engineering controls and that's to modify the systems that we've got. So um, looking at the HVAC and GU, obviously not the most ideal solution, but it's, it's uh, controlling the, the, the situation we have. Substitutions, could we replace the engine with hybrid technology or battery as well? But again, that's not readily available. It's being developed, it's being looked at, but it's certainly not readily available and it's not gonna be ready um, within a, in a few years. So we've still got some time or oh, time to get to it. And the other one is full electrification. That's the ultimate way. We had it in the results that when the train was in electric, there wasn't a problem. It was very clear that the problem was in self-powered mode. So if we electrified all the IP network, we wouldn't have this problem. But electrification will obviously take many decades. It's expensive and it's outside of uh, Atarch's control. So there's not much we can influence on that apart from saying that electrification of the network is the right thing to do. So really left with engineering controls. So it's understanding those, those two systems and their relationship in terms of NO2 levels and what we can do about it. So these are the systems. And so if we look at the top one, this is the engine and this is the exhaust system. So what makes the part of the, the, the engine um, Euro 3B compliant is this exhaust uh, treatment system. And the main focus really is the SCR or secondary catalytic reaction. So this uses urea or, or AdBlue, as it's commercially known. That injects it into the, into the exhaust and that reduces uh, NOx levels. And obviously NOx becomes uh, NO2 when it comes into contact with the air. So this is the main area. So we know it works at full power, but it doesn't when the train returns to idle. And we also noticed it when on just startup as well but only for a couple of minutes, but that's, we understood that. And the reason for that is this reaction of the urea with the exhaust to remove NO2 requires high exhaust temperatures. And that's what deals with the NOx. But when the engine returns to idle, the engine temperature reduces, so the exhaust temperature reduces, and the urea has to stop. Otherwise, you cause damage to your exhaust system. So the long-term effects of, of, of damaging the system. So it stops at a certain temperature. And that's why we saw this, this short 
increase. Now, what is happening is when the exhaust leaves the, the, you know, the train, the, the train then with, with the flow of the air over the train brings it straight into contact with this grill here, which is the intake for the HVAC system. So this box here is the HVAC system. And what's happening is the exhaust is just bringing it in into contact with here and the HVAC draws in those gases only for, for a couple of minutes. But the problem is the circulation of the air takes 20 minutes with pressure replenishment. So if we look at it as, uh, as a, a system and their interface, so we've got the engine or generator unit that produces exhaust levels. So it takes time to get to the, the tail end of the exhaust, gets drawn in to the HVAC again, time taken to do that, and then it gets brought in to um, the saloon. So that's why we saw a slight delay between when engine returns to idle and an increase in the saloon as well, obviously, because it takes time to, to filter into the saloon. But this is our relationship that we've got. So this is an interface that's not looked at in standards. Um, and it's just a new, new issue that, that was found that we're now trying to deal with. So it really was looking at options of what we can do with the engine and the HVAC to reduce it. So starting with the engine, it was, could we actually alter the fuel and the add blue settings to get a better uh, or uh, improve reduction in, um, in, in NOx. So we knew that if we get, if we inject it too early and too late into, into the exhaust, we can damage the exhaust system, which isn't good. If we change the fuel settings, we can increase fuel consumption. That could actually mean the train won't be able to meet its diagrams because we'll run out of fuel before the end of it. So that was, that was our concern with that. Um, a heated um, uh, sec secondary ca uh, catalytic reaction. So the 3B hasn't got a heated one, but actually the stage five does. So could we use uh, that technology and heat the STR, which will give us longer uh, reaction time? The problem with that is um, it takes up more space, it takes up more power, and the train wasn't designed to take it. So future trains and, and very similar designs of the, the, the 8300 platform do have stage five and they've been designed and, and accommodate that, that requirement. But these were built before that and, and didn't. But what we could look at was could we increase the engine idle speed, therefore increasing the exhaust temperature because the engine's working harder and increase the length of the time um, we've got the SCR working. But again, we've got to think about um, the consequences of that. So that was one option. The other one is to modify the exhaust. Could we change the exhaust to push the, um, or, or deflect the ex exhaust gases away from the fresh air intake? Um, so, but if we start changing the exhaust, we could increase back pressure, that could increase, it could alter performance. Um, and the other one that was, that was um, look, uh, well, discussed and is probably one I quite like because it, it reminds me of, of um, American hot rod cars was could we actually deflect the exhaust so there was a, a, a valve that would open up and when the trains at speed it'd be under the floor and then when we're in stations it would go back up through through the pipe through the, the up to the, the roof. Unfortunately group standards won't let us do that and there's other issues connected to that but I did quite like the fact that we'd uh, not only reduce an to the engine as well, but uh, nice idea, but didn't go much further than that. Um, oxygenated fuels and synthetic fuels, that was the other thing we looked at. There are um, now uh, other fuels on the market or developing. Is there anything that we could take from that? Is there a, a, a different type of fuel we could use? The problem is the results for, uh, for CO2 are great, but the, the results for NOx are mixed. And the other thing is, they're not, the synthetic fuels aren't commercially available yet, so they're still several years away if, if we get to there. Um, and at the moment, they're very expensive. So it wasn't, a, a, so there was concerns there whether we could really take that forward. For the HVAC, um, the first thing is fresh air damper control. So we, we have this ability to close the, the fresh air intake into the saloon. It's there as a, a, to, to resolve the 
uncomfortable feeling of a pressure pulse in tunnels, but it is controllable. There are ways we can control it. Now, currently it's, it's GPS signals, and that's in the database where all the tunnels are, but that does, does give us some control over the, the control of dampers. The problem with that is there is a standard for CO2 levels. So we need to make sure that we are still compliant within that. And we've also got to com you know, consider power consumption if we're starting to close in the dampers as well. So there's things to think about when we do that. Increased ventilation. Could we increase uh, the, the, the uh, HVAC power extractor fan to remove it quicker? The problem with that is, again, it could increase noise and there are strict levels for noise in the saloon on these trains. Um, and it could increase passenger discomfort because of uh, a, a strong airflow as well. And again, we'd have to um, carry out some more homologation testing to make sure everything was still compliant as well if we started looking down that road. Filtration, uh, as, as my research found, activated carbon adsorbs gases. So could we use that in, in, a, in the HVAC filters? The problem with that is we're very limited on um, space. We're limited on power again. So I've got to be considerate of the airflow through the, the filter to make sure that that's not impacted. Uh, and because we'd have limited space, would it be able to, to um, remove enough NO2 as, as the gases pass through it? And the other one is um, aerofoil or an exhaust stack modification. Um, could we put a deflector similar to the HST power car or an aerofoil type thing over the HVAC and um, or even modify the exhaust stack to, to reduce or put a clean, a, 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 that clean layer of air similar to the HST power car with the exhaust deflector over the, over the power car um, and lift the, the gases away from the tray. But again, what we, we consider it of is uh, well gauging and noise as well. So actually some of the very noisy areas of the train, the bogey, but also the pantograph, and that's because it sticks out on the roof of the train. And we'd have a similar thing with uh, if we start putting um, an aerofoil on it, again, that interaction with the air at speed could actually cause quite a, a noisy effect. And again, there are standards on, on noise of the train as well. So that was another consideration. So from that, um, we evaluated some um, different options and different ways we could um, bring rapid route into, into service trial, um, the potential for its solution, and could this be a single source uh, option as well? So it was a case of putting our resources into one thing instead of several things and, and speeding up time and, and reducing uh, unnecessary cost. So activated carbon filters. So um, it was um, evaluate different types of filter media. Um, now this is, uh, I, 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 I knew how to contact in the industry and I, I thought I'm gonna ask a silly question. And if I ask it to him, I could probably get away with it. Luckily they came back and saying, no, it is plausible. Um, and, and then after some, some contacts with, um, with the, within the company, I found out that actually it was M-Cell uh, that provided our filters now, not, not from Japan. So I was looking at all the Japanese specs, but uh, that's where M-Cell came in and uh, were extremely helpful in, um, in helping with, with uh, activated carbon into a, a filter. Concerned about pressure drop as well, because uh, within specifications within the HVAC, so that's one thing that had to be sorted out. Uh, identify the right activated carbon. There are many different types of activated carbon. There's different ways of treating it. What's the right one for us? Again, we're now going to fit carbon into a filter. So we've got to make sure that the fire approvals are, uh, uh, are understood and how we can manage that situation. And um, we needed a way to monitor for an extended trial. One of the things that we didn't know uh, was how long will activated carbon last? Because we're using a very small amount of it, we, because activated carbon is actually pretty expensive, the filter would have to go longer to compensate for the increase in, in, in cost. So it was mitigating the cost by making it go longer. So um, 
rapid service into trial is a filter. If it's a direct replacement to the HVAC filter, yes, pretty quick onto a train. CFD, yes, uh, we thought it, was, it, it could be possible, uh, and I'll come on to that in a minute. So, so, okay, so that's um, uh, computer fluid uh, design modeling. So that's using a, a computer to, to model the environment. Uh, potential to find a solution. It is, it was you know, considered as a high solution. Single source uh, possible. But again, if we can reduce the amount that the filter's taking, uh, adsorbing, then obviously we can make the filter go longer. Exhaust stack, uh, and this is where CFD modeling really came in, it comes into its own um, because modifying exhaust is, uh, for, for a service trial is, is not a, a straightforward thing uh, and really wasn't considered viable for uh, real world testing, but certainly viable for uh, CFD study. We needed to understand the maximum back pressure from NTU, and they were extremely helpful in helping us with uh, the um, flow rates, temperatures, everything we needed in exhaust, and how far we could really push back pressure. Um, and then the other thing, we, we, could, we, we could we make uh, use of the fresh air dampers as well um, to, to try and help with the situation as well? And would this help with modifying the exhaust away from it? So CFD study. Was definitely the right way forward for this. Final solution is possible um, if we can deflect enough of it away from the HVAC, definitely. Um, but as um, a single source solution, we, we knew it'd be, you know, we're not taking enough away. Fresh air damper control. Um, so could we uh, have more control over the fresh air damper? Could we link it to engine controls? But we've got to consider um, the fresh air. And the other thing at the time, which was very pressing, and it still is, was uh, virus spread. So um, um, COVID, uh, making sure where the, the, the advice was, make sure you've got lots of fresh air in your vehicle or in your room at the time, you know, keeping windows open. There we were actually doing the opposite by closing fresh air down. So that was also a, a serious consideration. We don't want to impact something else as well. Um, now GU modification, and this is where MT were, were extremely um, helpful and, and collaborative with us as well. Uh, and that was to, to understand what can we do to alter um, add blue levels, fueling, is there different ways of fueling? Can we modify the, the after treatment exhaust? What can we do to it? Um, again, as a rapid solution, that's gonna obviously take a considerable amount of time and possibly um, change our certification. So we may have to recertificate the engine if we weren't careful, if we went too far. So this is why it was considered not a very quick option. Again, um, not considered a, a, a final option because it didn't really change anything apart from reducing the time. That's probably where we could get to it was reducing the time rather than the levels. And then there was HVAC modification. Um, so it was, it was understanding, and this was going back to um, um, our, our colleagues in Casado and seeing how far we could push extraction, how far we could push the, the, the envelope with the HVAC system without contra, uh, uh, impacting on, on noise and power. And again, not really considered a, um, a, a, a something that we could easily do. It would take, certainly take a long time to, to update the software, test the software and integrate because of all that development time. Um, and, and as a final sol solution, possible, but, but not really considered like Um, now, with all these, these uh, ideas and the limited research, there was nothing that we could buy. There was nothing that we could go refer back to to say, would any of these actually work? The hypothesis says it does, but there was nothing to say it would. We we're in a different environment. We, we knew that in other areas we could affect and, and uh, either remove or, or filter or reduce NO2, but on a rail vehicle, with the limited area that we've got, could we do it? So um, again, um, luckily this were reduced timetables at um, uh, TPE kindly lent us a train for the week. Uh, so we took that out and we decided to test um, three areas, three key areas, three things that we could rapidly test to the train without doing major work to it, just to see if our hypothesis, our hypothesis could it, it worked. Could we, you know, was this something that we could develop further without spending too much 
time and effort in finding it was a dead end. This was a great way of understanding what we could do. So what we could do was we can manually control the fresh air dampers through the train management system. We could fit activated carbon filters, and this is where MCEL managed to, and this is all during COVID as well. So the, the world shut down and, and uh, it's amazing that the support and how we managed to get all of this together. But we got, we got, to, or, or, um, we got some activated carbon filters. Not ideal ones, but, you know, we weren't um, designed exactly to our requirements, but it was enough to prove the concept. And that's what we're after. This was no way going to be a final solution, but we were just proving if we did these things, could we reduce NO2? And the other one was higher engine speed. So this goes back to keeping the uh, exhaust temperatures high enough for uh, the urea to work for a little bit longer. So higher engine speed. And, and uh, again, um, much to, to my surprise, um, uh, our colleagues at, at META, I say our colleagues, I'm not with Hitachi now, but uh, allowed us access into the traction system for this test as well. So um, brilliant piece of collaboration again. Um, now we selected a route that we had, we could be repeatable on. And one thing that we were lacking from all our testing before, it was all in service and it wasn't very easily repeatable. Even on our first test on Great Western, the train on the final journey got diverted because of a signal fault. And this is real world things and this is what happens. But from a scientific experiment where you're trying to be repeatable in everything that you do, it's very difficult. So as much as we could control our, our world as possible, we decided to, to run on the high speed sections between Doncaster and Darlington and a midway point stopping at, at York. And that was so we had a station stop as well. So we could, because we knew when we reduced to idle. Um, so we did that and we had it for a week. And so um, we went out testing. So our first one was, for, was to carry out a baseline test. So our first one was just running up and down no modifications to the train whatsoever. What's our baseline? What are we going to mark everything against? And we did it several times during the day to give us a, a, a nice average. So the first one we looked at uh, after our baseline was uh, fresh air dampers. So the second day we would go out and we just test the fresh air dampers. So the dotted line here, as you can see all over the place, is each individual run. And then you can see the, the nice mean that we've got in place just so we can kind of benchmark where we're going. Um, the problem with, with this was again, COVID. So we couldn't have uh, an engineer in the cab with the driver. So after a bit of trial and error, they worked out a way of the engineer in the, the back cab, uh, being able to manually control the dampers with some kind of communication with the driver. Um, and someone else close to the cab to make this all happen. So I, I was quite impressed with, with the method they had in place in the end to make sure that it was a safe operation of the train, uh, COVID rules were, were followed and they were able to carry out this test. But what we could see was it worked. There was uh, an improvement by closing the fresh air dampers. Our mean was slightly higher, but that's because the fresh air replenishment rate was reduced. Again, this was manual, but it's certainly something to consider. So we knew CO2 would rise. It was very difficult to manage, uh, monitor CO2 because there was no one on the train. So it wasn't a full train, which is the problem with, with looking at CO2. But we could see that uh, NO2 did, did keep a slightly higher mean, but there was certainly a dramatic reduction by using it. Um, activated carbon filters. So this is the, the one that where it would constantly work. And as you can see, again, the dotted lines are each individual run and, um, is, and the solid lines are the means. So our red line is our, our baseline and our blue line is um, uh, our experiment. And you can see again, it worked. It, um, it, it certainly gave a reduction. This is the only one that constantly that worked. And we also looked at high engine uh, idle speed. So, we could alter the settings within in, in the, uh, the traction pack and we increase the idle speed. Again, as you can see, the baseline is higher than our experiment. Again, it proved that it did work. It proved that if we keep the exhaust temperatures higher uh, by, by, in, by making the engine run harder, it actually gave us an improvement. The problem is with that, and um, we checked the fuel, it did use a lot of fuel to do that. So I think it was around 15 to 10, 20% overall 
and the iron was 100% increase in fuel. So it's extremely uh, hungry on fuel. Again, we've got considerations of cost of fuel, uh, environmental impact, and the fact that the train might not meet its diagram. The information below is just, just really an illustration here. This is good, great collaboration with, with MTU. Um, they were actually monitoring in Germany. So they actually switched from electric channels, re re looked at it remotely to see if they could see anything else from the experiments as well, because they were very interested in what we were doing and, and uh, certainly wanted to help us. So as a summary, um, again, a box diagram is a great way of showing what was happening. You can see our baseline is actually quite high with our, our NO2. The filter trial, this shows a great reduction, so there's high engine idle speed, which is great. So it shows that our hypothesis worked. Now, unfortunately, we won't able to show dampers on this, but that's because um, the trial and error at the beginning of trying to get it right on that, it was more about communication. So it's the driver saying to the you know, test engineer number one, I'm returning to idle, right? Engineer number one then speaks to engineer number two at the back end of the train saying, okay, close the dampers um, and getting that, that coordination right took a bit of time. So unfortunately, we weren't really able to, to put it as a box diagram, but we had enough information to say it does, it does, actually, does actually work. So it was great that the experiments we used and the research always coming together and showing that actually all these things can have a, a, a positive benefit uh, impact on reducing NO2. So the other uh, trial that we did was, um, uh, was CFD modeling. So computer uh, fluid dynamics and this was ideal because this is starting to, to, can we take a computer model and monitor the model, model the real world? And it gives us repeatability. It gives us complete control of our environment. We can run those tests over and over again. I can run the train at different speeds for hundreds of miles. I'm not occupying the, the network. I'm not taking up valuable paths for passenger trains. I'm not using a, a, a vast resource to, to try these, these things. So it was ideal for that. So what we did was, um, this was actually, we're taking uh, the CAD model from uh, design and manufacture, so from build, um, because of the large, obviously you can imagine how, how um, intensive these, these files really are, it was a very basic model. So no bogies, no doors, we didn't need that, we didn't need to model that, so they weren't part of the design because all of a sudden that file size was growing bigger and bigger and trying to move that file around and manage that file was becoming un unwieldy and unnecessary for what we needed. So we had the basic CAD model that we needed. So we took the elements that we needed to model. We then developed that into a CAD model. So we can fill the doors in. We don't need to worry about the bogies because we know the relationship is on the roof. So that was enough for us to build our, our, our train model. So that's what our train looks like. And then we put it into an environment. And again, this is where uh, the real world data that we got was very useful. So that was used to build a, and, and construct our model. The information from MTU was extremely valuable as well. So that was giving us exhaust flows, temperatures that we needed to know from the various elements of the exhaust from engine to, to um, outlet of the exhaust. So a matrix was built to, to model our environment and then we could start modeling the, 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 um, the real world data. And then we modeled, we modeled that we compared it to real world data and then we knew we had a very strong model because it was showing the same results as our real world model. So we knew we were getting a comparable thing in a, in a digital form. So a bit of brainstorming on what could we do, what was realistic with CFD modeling. Um, an aerofoil wasn't considered viable because the airflow was going to be insufficient for and, and what we needed and there was too much noise in, in the exhaust to really give you that clear separation so it wasn't really working. What we did think uh, from, from our, our, that exercise was actually modifying the exhaust is the right way to go. So out of that we had two. We can put a 45 degree bend on it or we can taper it. So this is taking to so the 45 degree bend it's kind of taking uh, lessons learned from the Greek and um, the Israeli trains from the RSSB study. 
doing something similar there. And then the tapered one, that's similar to the, the class 57 with uh, West Coast. Um, now I'll mention here at the same time, uh, RSSB were also doing a similar study. So they were actually run in parallel. So there's some really interesting work um, RSSB have done and that's a uh, research paper T1234, so a nice easy one, um, which did a very similar things. And when, when we compared our, our, our models, we got different results, but that's because our trains were different. But the modeling and the way we did it was identical. So that was a benefit as well. So we knew it was great to have that, that cross-reference of actually we've done it, we've built it the right way, we've done the right thing because actually it's, it's very similar to, to RSSB, but what came from it and what was very useful and what I was able to feed back to our other project in Otachi was, if I come up with a solution that works, doesn't mean it's gonna work for your train. You're gonna to have to do this yourself with your train. Our environment works, our matrix works and the way we've built it and our, our method works, but putting a different train and a different engine can give you varying results. So that was very useful. That was a very useful exercise. But uh, um, when we run through, we also obviously model the baseline one, so we've got a comparison. So the results um, were uh, showed us um, really comparable um, ways forward. So both we could use, uh, both similar in a lot of ways, and some advantages over the other. Um, and we ran the model at, uh, so this is just small again, but we ran the model at different speeds. So 120 kilometers an hour, 80 kilometers an hour and 40 kilometers an hour. Now our C CFD model is very interesting. The reason we've got 40 here, kilometers an hour or 25 miles an hour is um, because that's actually the model said, that's your worst speed. Now it wasn't information that we could get from our real world data because 25 miles an hour is a very transient speed for us. We're either accelerating through it or breaking through it. We don't really sit at 25 miles an hour, especially in a city train. So we don't really sit there. So it wasn't something that we could really see in our data. But it was quite interesting to see that the CFD model pick that up. So we knew what our worst speed was. So we had these two options that we could take forward. Um, now, this is where we started to apply it back to the real world. Now the exhaust, on, on the uh, 8300s is one long, long piece. So this, this red box shows you that single piece. It goes for the whole the height of the body. So you've got the vehicle floor there, and you've got one long piece. So actually taking this out for a trial and replacing it with something else was not going to be a simple exercise. We needed a facility that could actually lift something that high away from the vehicle. Um, and then obviously that, that would take uh, a lot of resource and then it's quite a lot of expense to replace the exhaust. Still didn't mean that we wouldn't try it, but when we actually started fitting it to the build model, we saw that actually fitting a 45 degree elbow wasn't quite as easy as we did in the CFD model. Um, there are constraints, which meant we would have gone out of gauge. There wasn't really anywhere to bolt this to. So actually taking this further forward wasn't gonna be a simple task. Um, and it showed it wasn't, and the, the benefit from the results we got didn't really justify taking this forward. And then modification two, where we had a tapered uh, exhaust, the back pressures were extremely high. So yes, you can lift the exhaust out, but you increase the back pressure. And by increasing back pressure, you start causing problems with the engine, you start reducing power. So it wasn't really ideal. So, just in case, the other thing we went back to look at was the HST uh, kind of method, but I mean, would that work? Is there something we could do? So, exactly on the real vehicle, but it was good enough to do the tests. Could we push fresh air underneath and up over the exhaust? And um, the problem with this is it didn't really have an impact at all on the exhaust flow. And that's, a, Again, this was due to this low pressure area here that sits behind the HVAC. So the HVAC actually prevented us making use of the airflow to push the exhaust out the way. So it seemed to be a, 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 another issue. So what was interesting here was a smooth airflow would actually probably make things worse. I mean, I think it's quite good, covered quite well in the RSSB study. And with us, with our roof, with our HVAC units, actually we've got a low pressure area in some ways is giving us a benefit because we've got these, these, these different low pressure areas on the roof. But when we're trying to use it to our effect, 
it wasn't very good. So we didn't really take this much further forward because we saw that the air wouldn't wouldn't do, be um, be able to move the, the exhaust flow high. Um, but we did, and we are. And the reason for that is the activated carbon. We knew it worked, but the problem is we don't know how long it would work for. We know how much the uh, activated carbon could absorb, but we didn't really know how long it would take. And the best way to, to think about uh, activated carbon and the way it works is, is like a glass of water. You can fill the glass full of water to the brim. Now, if you do it very gently and slowly, it takes a long time. But if you do it very quickly and lots of flow, it's going to go very quick. But it still holds the same amount. But we don't, you, you can vary the time it takes to fill the glass. And it's very similar with activated carbon. Um, so we needed to actually do some real world testing. Now, the problem with that is our test equipment that we had was large, it was very bulky, um, and it certainly wasn't ideal for a six month trial. No matter which way we, we looked at it, it wasn't going to work because we'd actually, if someone went onto it once a week or, or or once a fortnight, they would have to travel up to, to Scotland and because the, the routes to, you know, just uh, to Aberdeen and to Inverness are uh, currently um, uh, diesel. So that's only the real place where we could test it uh, on, on, um, on the East Coast and similar on the Great Western really would have to want to go down to Penzance to get some real lengthy data. Now, I'm, I'm sure I would have had lots of engineers wanting to do Penzance in the summer, but would have, they would have been gone for a week and I'm sure the test manager would not have been impressed with me doing that. So we looked for something else. So we actually found some roadside, roadside as air monitoring equipment. Now by then technology kept it evolving. Uh, and as you saw, SSB had a quite a large trolley. We had it down to a suitcase size thing. And again, we're now down to um, a small box um, not quite as accurate, but good enough for what we're doing and fairly accurate, quite very accurate, uh, but not as accurate as, as the larger one. Um, but it also monitored CO2 particulates, so it was doing more for us as well. And because we were developing, looking at a different filter, uh, it, we wanted to understand, does it function as a filter as well? So that was the other thing that we couldn't forget. We we're actually introducing a different filter. Um, so we've got permission from uh, LNER to occupy uh, a small part of the luggage rack and a couple of seats because we needed a power supply. And the other thing to think about that was, was we're monitoring. Um, we needed uh, a UPS supply as well. Um, and that's because of neutral sections. So when we go through a neutral section, the, the at-seat sockets don't work and the, the, the unit required constant power. So we needed to, to find a way around that as well. So there's an uninterrupted power supply for, for neutral sections. And just in case things are shut down quickly, there's enough there to allow the unit to, to save its data as well. So that's the other advantage to that. So that's currently out there now, uh, and it's running on a six month trial because that's ideally what we want to, to get the cost benefit analysis, really. Can, if, if we can extend the life of the filter, that means there's a reduced costs in material uh, and even labor, which could offset costs of the the, the activated carbon as well. So that's why we need to understand it, but we didn't. Now we're gathering this data, um, we are actually putting it back into the CFD model. So future, um, so if this isn't successful, um, we can actually start using the CFD model again to actually develop and uh, design an activated carbon filter in a computer model rather than going out and doing real world testing again. So this is benefit, so this will benefit going forward as well. So this is um, giving us a lot of valuable information about how um, the, the, the carbon works. So it is out there right now. Um, I really was, when I said yes to this, this talk, I was really hoping that the trial would be finished, but obviously things always take longer than you, you, you want. But we've got a few weeks worth of data. So we've got the baseline and the baseline is actually from that, that extended run we did to Aberdeen um, like if, uh, a couple of years ago now, I think. Um, and um, we can see there is a slight increase as time goes by of NO2 levels, but 
We haven't really analyzed this data yet properly. This is really fresh new data. It's only a few, probably a couple of days old, really. Um, and we're, we're monitoring to understand that is, but this information will be the CFD model. The other thing that was very interesting to note, uh, and this was useful to see, because we were monitoring and collecting data in a different way, something that did prove was actually 40 kilometers an hour or 25 miles an hour is actually the worst for uh, production of NO2 or, or uh, the flow rate for NO2. So the CFD model predicted this and then the real world confirmed it. So this is the other way around. So this really helps support that CFD model was, um, was doing the right thing um, was, was, is, and it's proving itself time and time again as a, as a very effective um, uh, tool. And the good thing with this is that does mean we can do repeatable runs with a CFD model uh, and we can actually start reducing uh, cost and reducing the, the amount of resources. And the other thing is we're running around a training diesel, which isn't ideal, um, so we can reduce that as well. So actually, this is really still work in progress. So this is really um, the end of uh, probably stage one um, of, of our work. But uh, the systems approach adopted um, was uh, a solution for a fast response to the issue. So it was really a very open and honest approach to understanding the issue. It wasn't uh, blaming or accepting blame. It was a pure, um, open way of, of understanding the problem. But we also know that it's going to be a combination of modifications that, that will effectively run this change. Um, HVAC activated carbon filters, uh, it still needs to be evaluated for its performance and longevity. And there are things that we can do as well from this. So the, the, the current data that we're getting is only feeding in what we can do with an activated carbon filter. Uh, Atachi is still looking at how they can modify the, the HVAC, the fresh air damper, uh, to improve NO2 levels. So there's still work going on there to understand what we can do. Um, now the fresh air damper really should be used in all tunnels. I think this is one thing that we could benefit straight away. But again, that's going to require a software mod. That's going to take time to develop, but it can reduce the impact insulin because we know tunnels are the worst situation if the train changes power states in a tunnel. So there are things we can do quite quickly as well. And MTU, very collaborative, very helpful, uh, are also looking at ways of what they can do to enhance the engine. How can they reduce NO2 production? So they won't reduce the limits, but we maybe we can reduce the production of it. And they're even looking at the back pressure as well. Could, could we really push the limits a little bit further? Would that taper exhaust? Could we, could we do it without losing performance of the engine as well? So they're also taking a very open approach uh, and, and it's, it's been great working with them as well. Um, but um, uh, and the same with the, the filters with M-Cell. M-Cell have been fantastic in, in uh, working with us, um, helping us go through all these unknowns, finding the different activated carbon, selecting the filter uh, media, um, and, and also helping us with the, the, the uh, fire approval process as well, uh, and making sure that everything we're doing is, is correct and safe. So in conclusion, um, testing was vital to establish the cause. If we hadn't have gone out and replicated that test, we could have made assumptions and they would have been wrong. Everyone, there was this uh, assumption that when the engine's at maximum power, that's probably what's doing it. Actually, it was the opposite. And that was very interesting to see. So actually testing and confirming everything without making assumptions was the right thing to do. CFD modeling, um, that reduced time of development and allowed evaluation of from the real world. We were able to do a lot with that model and there's a lot more we can do with that model. It's been extremely valuable to do that CFD modeling. It is expensive, um, but it is it, 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 in, in terms of, of computer time, but when you compare that to real world testing, it's, it's certainly a, a faster and, and cheaper way of doing things. So it was ideal. And the real world is actually starting to prove the CFD model really works as well, with, especially with that uh, low speed as well. Um, real world testing on LNR continues. 
uh, and uh, does support, as I said, the, the CFD model of being a credible tool. More research is needed. Now, RSSB are leading this, and um, I really do encourage you to, to have a look at the RSSB website on, on air quality. There are some incredible things that they are doing, some great research, um, and, uh, uh, and we'll continue to, to work with them. Um, but again, this study was very focused on one particular aspect and not the wider issue RSSB are looking at. So RSSB are, are taking that very holistic approach to air quality, and it's the right thing to do where I was tasked with identifying a single issue and resolving that. Um, the hard truth is that full electrification of the IP network is the best solution to improve air quality for everyone. So not only the people on the train, but also um, the environment in general as well. So in big stations, we're not producing um, exhaust gases when you've got a fully electrified network and things are happening. So at the start of this, more of the Great Western Network was electrified before we could even go back and test after RSSB. Uh, elements in uh, Scotland, north of Edinburgh, um, up to Stirling, was electrified. The route between um, York and Leeds is currently being electrified as well, so that will soon be electrified. So there's these infills that uh, are occurring over the network, but it really does need to progress. Um, and I don't know the full ramifications of the cutbacks, but at the time I was looking at this, Scotland were looking at electrifying. Uh, Aberdeen and Inverness by 2035 and I, I do really hope that that continues and I hope uh, Great Western also have the ability uh, the option to, to improve uh, and extend their networks over time but again it's going to take time and it is finding a solution for now rather than tomorrow. Um, so yeah activated carbons Show, uh, activated carbon filters show a real potential and it's definitely uh, going to be progressed further. We've currently got the trial and we're getting some incredible results from that and it's been very, a very useful uh, experiment to run. Um, now, during the times that NO2 peaks, more than one solution will be needed. So filters is one way, the engine and the HVAC, but it is going to be a combination of two or even more ways of um, altering and reducing uh, either production or levels of NO2 uh, into the saloon. Um, and that's where we're working to get them as close to the WHO guidance levels as well. So we're not just thinking about the train crew with, with uh, well, and we've always been well under the, sorry, <laughs> well under the well, but we, we've also been, we have been under those, but it's now getting closer to that WHO guidance levels as well making sure that it's right for everybody, not just the workers, but also the, the wide demographic of, of um, the public that travel on the train. But really, the work continues. So this is just the first phase of this. Thank you for listening. All right, to any questions? Well, that was a fantastic presentation. Um, really, really, um, informative, a lot of hard work, clearly demonstrated. Um, there we go, your research techniques and data gathering. Um, so um, we, we have a couple of questions lined up on, on the chat. Um, if, if other people have got questions, please either enter them on the chat or um, you can electronically raise your hand if you take your mouse to the bottom of the screen and there's a reactions button. And if you press that, it allows you to raise your hand. Please do that if you wish to raise a question or type into the chat. Um, but we've got some lined up ready for you from, from eager members of the audience. So, so without further ado, um, let's, let's progress to some of them. So from, from Richard McLean, um, some previous generations of train have suffered from obvious smells in the HVAC, brake pads, engine exhaust. Um, uh, Richard states he's, he's not experienced such smells on your on, on the uh, class uh, 800s. Um, so, um, yeah. so, uh, so I can't. Uh, sorry, is it? Despite the threat you exchanged on high uh, NOx, uh, any ideas why this may be the case? Yes. Um, so the um, the 80X fleet has regen brakes. 
so that we reduce so we're not using the brake pads at higher speeds they come in they start blending at 30 and, and full at 10 so low speeds um we, we did have one recently that uh, actually caused a, a uh, was, was used for a bit longer because of, of, of some reason but we did have a, a slight smell then so it does so it can happen but because we've got regen so, you know, just, yeah <laughs> it, it's, it's a fact um but that's that's generally why uh, we don't get the brake pad smell because we're using a lot more regen um and and i suppose the other thing that we're actually interested in is with the activated carbon it actually could actually take out some of the smells really where so a lot of the, the filtration is coming from is actually taking out smells rather than anything else so there may be a benefit from that as well okay uh right uh richard richard again um so he's, he's asking the lessons learned um how can they be fed back into standards uh, you know, I think you said I think you said the the only standards is the CO two level, and not the other levels. So you know, I think that's something that will be changing in the final areas. Definitely, and this is where the RCSP uh, are working towards developing a new standard. So I really do encourage people to to find out what they're doing and, and have that input. It's again, there is so little information on what the right level is for a, for a vehicle, and even. Um, and, and this is coming up from the RCSB study is, is those mixed environments not fully enclosed, uh, not fully open, those, those half and half areas, what should the levels be? So there is still work to do to understand what the level of um, historical stock as well. Um, one thing that I, I wasn't able to do was completely redesign the train because it had been built. So it's working within the environment that you've got. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, that's something that RCSB are currently working on. Now, a related question, if I can just throw one in myself, um, to, to motorway traffic. There's, there's a, an area on the M1 that says speed reduced to, uh, to reduce air, air quality issues, um, not, not for any other reason. Is there, is there some values from motorways and that we could share in the rail industry on, on NOx levels and uh, I mean, possibly. I, I mean, I was, I was trying to find solutions. That's why I had to expand my search. There's nothing on NO2. Um, but again, uh, I think there was a study that, that showed uh, uh, NO2 levels within a, within a vehicle could be, I think, up to six times higher than outside the vehicle as well. So it's, it's looking at those studies as well, because that's the thing. I, I was looking at a confined area. That's, that's taking an exhaust, and it's the same with the car. That'd be taking an exhaust from, you know, potentially from the car it's, it's following, and those levels are just as, you know, potentially just as high. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Uh, so another question um, from um, from uh, John Tomkin. Uh, you mentioned uh, the environmental impacts on repeatability of real world testing. Um, did the weather uh, have an impact on the NOx levels, rain, humidity, temperature, etc. Um, I mean, this is this is uh, this is a very good point. Um, again, with real world testing, we were only going out. You know, we, you know for TP, it was one day. For um, you know, uh, LNER, it was a day, and the same with Great Western. So, um, really, I couldn't. I don't think it did, but I couldn't say hand on heart that it didn't have an impact on it. It could. Um, but again, because it's, we didn't have that repeatability, it's very difficult to say. Okay. Um, right, uh, from um, A. Prenter, uh, Sam, an earlier slide showed the exhaust and the HVAC on the same side uh, of the train. Um, uh, would it be possible to swap the HVAC intake uh, sides, opposite sides of the exhaust? Nice idea. Unfortunately, the intakes are on both sides of the HVAC. So the exhaust might be on one side, but the actually intakes on both sides. And we, we I mean, we even, um, I mean, one of the things that is also looked at, this is a good, good point, um, is damper control. Could we actually, the damper, you know, could we close the dampers one side? It doesn't quite work that way, because that was one of the things we looked, could we close the damper on the side that the exhaust is to help reduce it and also maintain fresh air intake because we wanted to keep fresh air in, especially with um, reducing you know, making sure that we were meeting other compliance of fresh air, especially with um, COVID. Um, but unfortunately, it's just, you can't quite control it that way. 
um, and, and you still need you still got intakes on both sides. You need them both sides as well to keep the fresh air intake. Okay. But yeah, good point. Okay. Um, right, Tom from Mitch and Flint. Uh, what considerations have been given to air quality in the cabs? Presumably, I think Mitch means the, the drivers' cabs, um, yeah. particularly any training cabs in the formation. So, uh, so let's start with the driver. The driver is at the front. Is uh, very, very low, well, not measurable even, so low levels of NO2 because there's no exhaust flow. And you're right, the, the, the training cab where you've got uh, train managers or train crew in there, um, yes, there is an increase, but uh, all our testing showed it was all well below, the, I keep saying well, well, it was all below the well. Uh, so the workplace limit exposure limits. Now the problem with that is it's not, the, and I, I didn't really go into it in a lot of details, but it's not a very comparable standard to use. And this is the problem. We're not really using ideal standards to, to measure what we're doing. Uh, the well really uh, looks at the individual and that them going around their day and their exposure. So a train crew manager or a guard will be getting on the train, you know, for, for 20 minutes or an hour and then getting off that train They'll be in stations, there'll be uh, train crew depots, possibly uh, maintenance depots as well. They will be in different areas and really you're meant to follow the person rather than a fixed location. So that's why it's not an ideal standard, but we were in a fixed location and all the data that we got from on the train was we were always below the workplace exposure limits. Um, so, um, Mitch, Richard's also asked, are there any, uh, any previous uh, stand, uh, sorry, expanding this quest, previous question, um, are there any standards that have been identified that would be worthy of amendments? Um, so, um, is requirements oh, yes so yeah so the road road trump country we really need rssb to complete their study and mm. i think that's a, a very important thing and i think that's one thing that came out of my work is that we need to understand the situation we need to understand okay. what the right levels need to be um and we do have well and we do have who guidance but again they don't consider a train and i, I really do encourage everyone to to take note of what RSSB are doing and have an input on, on some of their output because that's going to start setting the standards for, for the future. Um, we do need to consider the wider demographic of, of passengers and uh, that's extremely important but also you know the, the train crew as well and understand those differences but I, I think if anything RDG are going to take I think they need uh, the, the information from RSSB to make that, that judgment. Um, right, so, so um, we've also been asked, um, uh, how do your results compare with the wider DMU fields? Is, you know, is, there, is there even any measurements from DMU fields? So it, this is contained in, in the uh, RSSB study T1188. So it's worth a look at that. So there are other fleets. We were the highest, so the 800s were the highest NO2. Um, and the reason for that is, um, it was actually when you're trying to manage the exhaust, there is a, a balance between particulates um, and NOx. So your control of your after exhaust treatment, you're trying to balance not exceeding your particulates and not exceeding your NOx levels. And so our particulates were extremely good, but our NOx levels were high only for those those two minutes when the engine returns to idle and the exhaust temperature just that isn't able to, to generate the heat for the urea to work. But yeah, we, that's, that's why we were very concerned when we saw these initial results, we were the highest by far, and that's what we needed to understand. But yeah, if you wanted to have a look at uh, other DNA fleets, that report. So. And what, what, what report was that, Sam? Just yeah. so everyone can, well, what research projects was it? T1188. 1188, okay. okay. Right, um, so only Brown asked a question, but I think that's something sort of repeat from the previous one. And I'm just going to skip that there. Um, right, um, so from Stuart de Burr, can the used cabin filters be reactivated for re reuse or they throw away? So, yes, it is. 
extremely expensive. And by that time, we've generally integrated it into the filter. So unfortunately, it will be a throw item. But again, as I was saying, where we're currently changing the filters uh, on a more frequent basis, one thing that was a requirement was we extended the life of the filter. So we'd get the benefit of less waste as well, because we, well, we went for a better filter media with the activated carbon to give, it, to give us that extension. Uh, and that, that, was, that was part of it. So unfortunately, it is still a throwaway item, but we certainly won't be throwing as much away as we currently are, if, if successful. And actually, one of the byproducts is even if the activated carbon isn't successful, the filter itself were, is. We know it's performing very well, so we could actually switch to that and reduce our waste as well. Um, we've also checked, and it's also uh, and it's worthy of another talk from MCell on this, is that it could even be um, treated with, with certain things to actually help uh, fight COVID as well. So there are things we could do with that filter, and it's probably worth a, a future talk on that, just on its own. Okay, well, we're, ne we're nearly there, Sam. Um, we've got to hear. Um, really good questions, very good questions, I think. Um, right, will future work uh, using the computer model be used to identify the optimal location for H HVAC? A lot easier. Um, um, under on, on the sign, I, I, th I think. I think it could. Um, I think I think this is one thing that that the industry probably needs to start pushing harder, and there is already work towards it. And and we talk about the digital twin uh, and things like that. And I think uh, it's definitely the right way to go. We can learn a lot, uh, and the computer models are becoming good enough to use. Uh, and and I don't, I'm not sure if we're, we're not quite there yet to to fully do it, but the data that we're getting now it's is a, building a, a better better model it's a very valid point that you, you mentioned that we was able to compare the real world data with the cf uh, and data and, and, and validate the model mm -hmm. you know it's, it's a vital vital part of the step you know in, in, in cfm and vampire and, and other modeling techniques you've got to validate the model before you can start to rely on the model so yeah Definitely. Uh, right. And so, I think with um, that we can start. start. We've got one, one, one final question on here. I think you've answered it previously. Uh, it's about the, um, the both the left and right hand side of the HVAC. Um, um, Dave Pipe is asking, can you uh, close the, uh, the dangerous side? Um, sorry, close one side for the most dangerous couple of minutes. Yeah. I'm this is, I mean, this is one thing that we've been looking at. Um, the issue is we've got to get our timings right, and that's that's going to take a lot of, of, of work to understand the timings. Um, then we've also got to manage CO2 levels as well. So CO2 levels will climb, will climb and, and also power consumption will, will go up as well. So it is, it is, it's something that is being looked at. Um, but again, it's protecting more of the we, you know, it's protecting the people rather than, than the whole situation. But yes, it's it's certainly still being explored. So, uh, Andrew, um, is anybody um, raise the hand, please? Who's, um... There is. John Tompkins has been waiting very, very patiently. You know. John, you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your question? Yeah, no worries. Uh, firstly, uh, Sam, that was brilliant. Uh, really informative, and uh, that's definitely going to help with our engineering change. That we've got in the pipeline for the activated carbons. Um, That's good to know. So obviously, your main concern doing this was passengers and the NO the NO two levels in inside the train. But how does that translate to outside the train? So for obviously ma maintenance technicians inside a maintenance shed. Um, so was there any sort of scope? Did you did you broaden the scope out to that? Look at inside maintenance sheds when they're being run inside that, um, or is there any future plans to do that as well? So uh, we, we didn't look at that because we of why are two levels high in the saloon? That's really what we're looking at. RSSP are expanding uh, their, their work. I believe it does contain, it look at depots, you know, freight yards, stations. So they are looking at the wider area. But yes, I can imagine that in, in, an, in an enclosed environment without adequate extraction, um, it, it could be high. How, how high, I don't know. If it's within the workplace limit enclosures, I don't know. It's, it's certainly worth um, further study. 
And, it, and also, another, so another question, Andy, if I, if I may. Yeah, um, so obviously you talked about the HVAC dampers having a, quite a, well, a, an impactful result on reducing the NO2 levels. Mm. To me, it would just make sense just to, rather than have the speed setting of 100 kilometers an hour to then set that dampening off, so you just have it automatic. Every tunnel you come to, the HVAC damper just automatically dampens, I guess, un until you're under a, such a, a very so sp s slow speed, so you're not stuck in a tunnel. <laughs> yeah, oh, right, so, right. So you want fresh air coming in, but... So that's it's a very good point, and, and it is one of my recommendations. The trouble is it does require a software update, and we've got to understand, because of the way yeah. it takes the, the signal from the train, because it's a, it's a signal. So no, it's not the HVAC system itself, it's a signal from the train that, that yeah. feeds into a GPS database on TMS. So yes, I completely, I, I full-heartedly agree, it's the right thing to do. Now, the other thing that will happen is the damper will automatically open after five minutes, and that's to manage CO2 levels. So it will yeah. just open up again if needed. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It will protect... So we'll do that. So I, I agree with you. I think it's the right thing to do. We just need to, to get on and... Uh, have you, yes, yeah, so I was going to say, have you started anything? So do, do do we want to team up and do a joint PIP request to attach you to look at that software update? We can do uh, that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm up for that. Yeah, okay. Because <laughs> it was one thing I said, this is an easy win. Why don't we do this? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. When, yeah. I, when you're going through, I just thought this, 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 yeah, it's an easy win. We should just get on and do it. Yeah, definitely. And it's, it's one, yeah. Now on this side, but yeah, I'm probably standing more of a chance, but <laughs> it's, it, is, it, it is just, uh, we, we just need to get it in as a, a, a software update. I think it might be an HVAC and a TMS update. Yeah. But the good thing to, to, to note is all the tunnels are in the database. Yeah. Because I, was, I was also part of that side as well. So I know for a fact they're all in there. It Because it, obviously at the time you don't know what the line speed is. You work out where your tunnels and put them all in there. So the yeah. database is fine. It's just removing that that speed element from it, and again, you've got that safety element of after five minutes, if you're in a tunnel, it will open. Yeah, brilliant. Now, the other benefit is I've sat on a train when you've been stationary in a tunnel, and then one at one two five goes past you, your ears still pop because you get that pressure pulse. So actually, there's also that benefit as well. Yeah. So yeah. So even from its its original requirement, it's an improvement. Definitely. Right. We'll be in touch. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you very much uh, for, for that question, John. Um, right. Um, with, without further ado, I'm, I'm conscious the night's dragging on a little bit. Um, we had a really good set of questions there, I think. Um, can I call upon uh, Nigel to, uh, to to give the vote of thanks, please? Um, as people have said already, excellent paper on um, on the subject and the you know, the way you've uh, Shown that a mixture of modelling and uh, you know, almost that feeling, is, to a certain extent, <coughs> um, works together. Um, what one thing question I've got um, was on the, the 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 twenty minutes to change the air, but what does that actually mean in terms of changes of the air in the saloon? Um, I'm comparing it to a Mark III when I can't remember what the number is, but I remember it was it was in the tens of saloon volumes an hour that you change the air. Um, but I'm assuming that's down to to how much fresh air you draw in as a percentage of the air that you're distributing. It is, yeah. I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but uh, it, it's also to do with power consumption as well. Yeah. So it's making sure not over because uh, you know, of pressure as well as so it's just kind of that mix of return and pressure yeah so um i think you've you've you've, you've done a really good job at explaining quite a complicated subject and and the interesting the really nice thing is that we've actually doing it on facts rather than so much this industry does things on major you know on i think it might be rather than backing it up. So it's really nice to see that actually happening in, in the industry. Um, I know we always used to moan about BR being slow at looking at changing things, but I think BR used to do similar things in, in the good old, in, we might say the good old days. Anyway, um, if everyone could uh, join with me in, in thanking Sam in the usual way. Thank you.
Nice. No, that's uh, that's that's wonderful. Um, Sam, you've done a sterling job there. Um, if I could just um, remind uh, people one one last time, the, the next event is on the eighth of December. Um, information will be out shortly. Should be a really interesting night. I've got um, an idea what Derek's talking about, but I don't know for certain what railways around York is going to capture. Um, but I'm, I'm personally looking forward to it. Um, so, so the 8th of December, um, if, you, if you look out on the uh, normal channels, um, if you've already signed up to our um, contacts list, you'll get notified. So, uh, so yeah, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, it's really good. Andrew, thank you for rescuing the day with the Zoom license, um, recovering our um, cock up. Um, so, so thank you for that. Um, Anytime, Andy, no swipe. So, so no, that's good. So, um, so, so yeah, um, so yeah, safe travels home, everyone, or you've already uh, at home if, if you've not left work yet. So, thank you very much. So, thank you again, Sam. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Sam. I didn't know whether any uh, anyone wanted to hang around afterwards, which is why I left it uh, open. But uh... yeah, I was I was expecting the same as well, so that's why I thought I'd hang around. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently okay. not. No, I'll give him a call. But thank you so much for for saving us there. It's uh, it went well in the dress rehearsal this morning. Oh, oh no, uh, it's just that um, co-host permission. Yeah. If it's not in there, yeah. Because he did it from but, a different uh, account, and uh, we got oh, another set up. Yeah. No, don't don't worry about it. It was no no problem at all. I didn't want to sort of muscle in, but I thought, well, if I if I've got a way of rescuing it, it seemed churlish not to. I'm glad you did, because I was running out of things to say. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no problem at all. And uh, well done. That was uh, an awful lot to put over, and uh, you know, put over really well aside from all the the time that you know you had to invest in um in, in this in you know logically thinking through what you wanted to test to prove as Nigel said with um you know facts to back up where you got to I take it you know John no I don't know no but I've, like, oh I but, got, no I don't know no. right he's he's my IET fleet engineer oh right that, that that was the linkage just in case you hadn't uh, you didn't know i got the impression he was involved on, on your side with with the, the iot so I was yeah yeah. Him, so. yeah he um he was with us uh as an apprentice and i think he stayed for a couple of years out of his time um but he saw greener grass in the bristol area in stoke gifford depot um uh, so he was with itachi for about four years and, and then decided to um, have a new opportunity with us so we seeing a little bit of both sides that's good it, it gives you a, it's certainly an eye opener seeing it both sides yeah indeed but no that was absolutely fabulous well done thank you thank you so much Mark. yeah all right i'll uh, catch up uh, with you sometime soon definitely well if you want me to give this talk to your route and let me know and uh, i'll be happy to do it again if you want Oh, okay. Um, they that they, they may well be uh, very interested because you know there's plenty of technical content in there. It's probably um, a, a good one for some of the younger engineers just to get them thinking about you know the art of the possible and what you can actually do yourself. It's not all about um, consultancies and getting other people to do work for you. Yeah, I don't think we would have got as far as we did with with consultancies. We used them as much as you know, we had to, especially with CFD stuff, because obviously we didn't have access to that. But no, you know, asking to do, you get, I mean, people went out of their way at times, especially the test engineers sitting with me on a train for hours on end. <laughs> Goodness knows what, how much the consultant would have been for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely.
Yeah, but I'm happy to. It's one thing that, that our region has, has suffered with is uh, our technical talks have dropped off. And I think that's probably what's helped hurting our attendance. Yeah. Is that, I mean, you know, it's like the next one. It's more about history of railways rather than the, the technology. I think we need to get back to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'd, uh, I'd concur. Right. I'd better go and uh, take Mrs. Skinner's photo. She's off on a cruise with her sister later in the week and she needs a photo for her uh, pass for the ship. All oh, right. Okay. I'm staying here working, so there we are. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I got the short straw or the long straw. I don't know. I'll find out when I come back. <laughs> yeah, in, indeed. Okay. Hey, good to see you, Sam and chat. Yeah, definitely. Take it easy. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks.